One of the reasons why this has been bottom up, it's because Maria Corina, I would say she was the spark that managed to get people out of political apathy. And the only reason why she was able to do that is because she has been extremely consistent. Hi, listeners. I'm Shem, podcast producer here at the CPSI. I'm popping in just for this intro today because our eponymous host, Rashid, couldn't quite materialize a studio setup at 30,000 feet. This episode, featuring political analyst Parsifal Tesola, was recorded just days before Venezuela's contentious 2024 elections and promises to be an insightful discussion. As always, comments are open. Hello, Parsifal, and thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you, Rashid. I'm happy to be back. Yeah, I think last time we spoke on the podcast was over a year, at least a year ago. It was more, I would say two. Luckily, we now live in the same city. Yes. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll have more opportunities to talk. I definitely think so. So I want to talk mostly about Venezuela and I want to jump right into the part of the last time I followed closely politics of Venezuela, I guess before the recent skirmish about the venezuela Guyana border, was when uh, Juan Guaido was seen as this important figure for the opposition in Venezuela. That completely went off the, the rails. Same as like ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So from then to now, the composition of the opposition in Venezuela, and is it actually a single particular movement that has any potential of getting past Maduro in these days? Or is it simply like Guaido, this kind of made up myth from foreign policy? To be sure, this is new territory for Venezuela's political landscape. In my view, we hadn't seen anything of the sorts, especially when we're talking about opposition to Chavismo, first against Chavez and now with Maduro. A little bit of context, Juan Guaido, it was a window in time, this rather young inexperienced politician, got thrown in the limelight, and it all became a thing primarily because of backing from the United States and the leadership that came from Washington, and it's what made it an international phenomenon. That being said, there was an important part on, done by a coalition of opposition figures that surrounded Guaido and then saw him as an, a, a way out. So there was a lot of work done at the foreign policy level in Latin America primarily to gain support. And I frankly say they did a good job and there was a lot of backing. Again, most of it probably wouldn't have been possible without U.S. policy driving the issue at international levels and bringing the EU on board. But again, this was, as I mentioned, it was a window of opportunity given the context at the time fraudulent elections had just taken place but again this was up as it was uh, on a top bottom kind of policy there wasn't any general public support most people weren't just aware of what was going on so maybe in the capital in caracas and some other major cities you did see some public backing but again this wasn't a national moment and as effervescent as it was at the beginning it fell down the bubble burst a few months into it and there was an important challenge at the time to the maduro government but again they were able to maneuver it they, these are very experienced politicians people the military again it was a small challenge and they got past it this time around is very different the lead political figure is Maria Corina Machado. It's the first time she's actually been able to garner public support. Why do I say this? She's been in the Venezuelan parliament, well, the National Assembly, the equivalent, for over two decades till she was banned from running for any public office. And if I remember correctly, this was in 2015. 2016. I might have want to check that, but it was around that time. And she was a member of the National Assembly for us in the mid 2000s. And what makes her different is that she's had the same message since her first day in public office. So she has been drilling that narrative for yeah, basically 20 years. Given all the that have come over and over and over again from candidates and political leaders and in the opposition side, let's say that there was a 
I would call it political apathy about how the country was being handled, even though that it was pretty obvious to everyone. I think that we, there, there's a saying that says that the people vote with their feet. And nowadays, the estimates that around 8 million Venezuelans have left the country, that's over a quarter. We're talking about 30%, close to 30% of the population has left in the last nine years. And this is when they started counting, which was around 2015, because before that, there, there was also an exodus of people. So yes, that is one of the reasons why migration has become a huge issue all throughout Latin America, but it also has exacerbated problems in the U U.S. southern border as a large percentage of the people crossing are still coming from Venezuela. Let's dive into a bit of those points. Right now, of course, yes, the Venezuelan economy is bad, but what was the turning point? Because the economy was in free fall for at least a decade or more than a decade. What was the turning point where the excess really got to accelerate? When it accelerated or when it started to change? There was like 8 million people leaving 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Okay, so the worst period was started around 2015 and it got worse by the day. And I would say the bottom was around between 2017 and 2019. So those two years, I remember I lived for a, a short period in Caracas just around that time. And having lived outside of the country was quite shocking when this time I spent there because I had never seen there was just, and this is in Caracas, which is, let's say, the place that the government tries to keep the most afloat in terms of services and the basic services and food, including food and people just eating out of the garbage. The streets, they were a desert and no one in the street after five to 6 p.m. Extremely hostile and dangerous city. And that's around the time when there was an explosion of people leaving the country. So those two years were, I would say, the bottom of the bottom. And then, um, ironically, around just right before the pandemic, probably way outside my area of expertise, but the pandemic helped stabilize things because people were obligated to stay back home. A lot of people had already left. So he gave time and some leeway to the government to give some public support, some funds. There was a lot of, I don't even remember the name that they gave it. Basically, they went into the dangerous parts of the city and they did this cleansing of these areas, a lot of extrajudicial killings. So it was a mixture of everything. It's mostly in Caracas? Mostly in Caracas, yes. Because okay. outside Venezuela's three, four main cities, including Caracas, these are, I wouldn't say to the level of ghost towns, but these are uh, places where even today, the norm is not to have electricity. That's the norm. You will have electricity, I don't know, for six, eight hours a day. Same with running water. So these places are, nowadays, they are leaving their lifestyle is based on the money being sent from abroad. So there's a new dynamic that the dynamic that a lot of Central American countries are familiar with, so it was same as the Caribbean, that since there's a huge diaspora living abroad, they're sending a lot of money back home. I don't know. There's a lot of factors involved. You could call it that they managed to stabilize things. Now, what do I mean by this? Because it's not that things just started getting better. The thing is, when you dig it a uh, hole that deep, even the smallest increase in the economy, it's a plus. So it's all about seeing where we're coming from. And there's an important factor here that ever since PDVSA, Venezuela State on en oil enterprise, and basically the entire oil and gas sector in Venezuela collapsed because of just straight out malfeasance and, and lack of maintenance, they had to well, look for other sources of income. No one understands how they managed to destroy their golden goose. So nowadays it's crazy. I think for the first time since I've been alive and I'm 41 years old, there's a strong tax policy. Right now, people are paying taxes in Venezuela, especially mid-sized to big-sized private companies. And to be honest, they're very strict. Let's just say it started being efficient, the tax collection system. And I think one of the reasons is basically because they had to find some sort of income. Obviously not official numbers, but according to several civil society organizations and some international organizations that tend to that study and follow black market economics in Venezuela, including illegal means like illegal mining, drug trafficking. Estimates nowadays range from a very conservative 30-35% of Venezuela's GDP comes from 
these kind of legal sources all the way up to 60 to 65. So anything in between. Venezuela is producing its oil capacity started going up about a year and a half ago, but it's still way below historical production levels. So Venezuela, when Chavez came to power, was producing around 3 million, 3.2 million barrels a day. Nowadays it's around 800,000. And in, in the worst period, 2017, 18, 19, we were as low as 300 to 400,000. Things have picked up a little bit. The economy has shrunk dramatically. Even Venezuela's GDP compared to, I think the latest numbers I saw was like compared to 2011, 2012, like right before Chavez passed away. Taking that as a point of departure, Venezuela's economy nowadays has shrunk around 75% from taking that comparison. So it's minimum. It's, I don't remember the exact number, but it's the Venezuela. Again, there's the last census population census was around 15 years ago. So we really don't know how many people live in the country. Estimates put us around 20 to 22 million, when in theory we should be around 32, 33. But again, we these are just estimates based on the immigration numbers from other countries. So I'm curious about the immigration point. Of course, you have basic guess of why people would take the choice to leave. But at the same time, is there a pull, a major pull factor that would encourage people to come to some countries? Or is it really just a push factor? I'm going to leave. We'll see what happens anywhere else. But do people normally have a plan after they leave or just get out and then see what happens? I would say the latter. This has been a purely, or can I say 100%, but primarily driven by domestic factors. This is a push. This is, look, life is unsustainable here. Can't find a job. And the worst time, basic services weren't available. This was primarily domestic driven. And once you get that ball rolling down the hill, a family member tells you, look, I'm in Bogota. I found a job here. You should come. Or I'm in Santiago. Or I'm in Lima. Or I'm in, look, or I managed to cross a border to the US. I got this guy that helped me cross. So it's all that compounded. But the point of departure is domestic. You know, there are many well-written histories about dictatorships and social economic collapse, of course, as you probably won't get a good one about Maduro and Chavez until like maybe 10 years from now or so. Right now, it's always a surprise when you see these things happen, but the people are still in power. Is it because the military just that controlling in the country? What is the basis for Maduro to still have so much power in Venezuela? The answer is quite long, but if I were to summarize, Chavez is, is the main reason. This guy was a political titan and not in a good way. He always get together with Venezuelan friends. It's very common for the political topic to just pop up inevitably. And we always wonder what would have happened if Chavez hadn't died. And odds are he would still be in power and he would still be popular. This guy, it's quite incredible. Incredible. It's a combination between charisma, between his way to completely obliterate his political opponents, how he centralized power and his legacy still lives on because his the only political message that Maduro has is that he is Chavez's appointee. That's what he has going for him. That's the only thing that keeps him connected to the base that still supports him because it's a minimum compared to his historical levels. They put him around 20% of the population. But again, it's extremely hard to do these kind of surveys in, in today's Venezuela. So take them with a grain of salt. But what kind of person still supports Maduro? I would say it's completely ideologically based. It's more about the typical anti-imperialist, very nationalist, ideological kind of support. These are fervent believers on Chavismo as a political movement. That's the remaining percentage of people that still support him. But are these people well off? Or are they also like in the streets getting food and garbage? There's a lot of people that are pretty well off. We have these kind of people everywhere, just that they see, don't care much for society around them, the country. It's just about they have good business with government going on and they may turn a blind eye to everything else. 
But is that the ideology driving? No, no. But you asked, what are the factors of keeping Maduro in power? That's one of them. They've created a group of, let's call them entrepreneurs, that have built new businesses in this new Venezuela that has emerged under Maduro. And they're very well off and they want to protect their interests. And they know for a fact that if Venezuela were to change one day when and some sort of rule of law would return to the country, all these businesses will just fall apart. So it's in their interest that Maduro stays in power. And among these people, there's a very large presence of military officials. And that's where the whole illegal mining takes place. This is the Venezuelan Amazon. It's called the Mining Arc, the richest region in mineral resources in Venezuela. And this was no one's land. This is where the Colombian guerrillas take refuge. There's turf wars with the Venezuelan military. A lot of people involved in these activities are the primary supporters of Maduro, and they also provide the arms. And so it's a combination between this new found privileged class with businesses tied to government and the mid to high level military officials that are part of that whole group of people. So when you put them all together, that's what keeps the government stable. So now there is this bottom up opposition movement that is gaining more traction. How did that become such a coherent, especially opposition to Maduro? That's a question for historians that's just 10, 15 years from now, because it's, we're still in the midst of it. So it, it's hard to analyze it. And frankly, at, at a personal level, I'm still skeptical and quite impressed at the same time, because it's inevitable not to get your hopes up. And that's one of the things I, a few months ago, I was like, oh, this is not going to happen again. I'm not going to get my hopes up, but seeing Maria Corina Machal, we'll, we'll get back to her, just touring the entire country. It's incredible. And she has everything against her. Not only being barred from running for any type of public office for a decade now, she cannot get on a plane. So she has gone to the most remote towns in Venezuela. So for the past three, four months, that's more, maybe around six, has been touring the country and being stopped, having problems with gas stations, cannot give service to anyone supporting or much less the caravan of people uh, driving her around because they would get shut down. The hotels that she stays in get shut down. If she stops at a restaurant, this, you could just look at the news for the last two months. Every single place that she has been to, whoever gave her some sort of support as just giving beverages to her team would get visited by the tax agency and being closed down for whatever reason. So that's the context she's moving in. But going back to one of my initial points, she's one of the reasons why this has been bottom up. It's because Maria Corina, I would say she was the spark that managed to get people out of political apathy. And the only reason why she was able to do that is because she has been extremely consistent, her message, for a long time. And given everyone that's been part of the opposition in the past, and a lot of political figures nowadays are the same guys, they're all men, who have been talking about change and pushing Maduro and before him Chavez out. They range from not liking these people to just straight out disgust. What exactly is her message? That Venezuela has to change. She has toned down. She was much more um, arguments or her points were uh, more stringent. When you look at the kind of words that she used 10 years ago, she did manage to get the right level to that point where you don't talk about the government. You don't talk about Maduro. It's more about, look, focusing on Venezuela has to change. She talks about migration. She talks about dissolving the, how the family unit has completely evaporated, how we need new kinds of policies. She made it more about Venezuela than about who we are up against 
And I think that was an important change in her narrative about where we are today. And I think that's an important change. But the thing is, she's always been saying that in one way or another, it's just the words have changed. But the fact that she's a woman, I think it's also very important. Venezuela has never had a female president. And most, especially in the Chavez years, the Chavismo years, these are all been men. So she also was able to tap into that. She uses a lot of that she's a mother, that all her kids are abroad, that her family is fractured like yours, like mine. And the fact that they have, even within the opposition, have tried to force her out. Even when Juan Guaido came, came, just popped up out of nowhere, she was completely sidelined. And this was not on purpose and because she was seen as quote-unquote radical. Because that's usually the attacks within the opposition that have been friendly fire has been huge against Maria Corina until just six months ago when the primaries took place. Against all odds, no one thought they were even going to be possible. I was able to vote in Bogota. At the time, it was quite moving to see droves and droves of Venezuelans showing up too. And these were like North Korean levels of approval. It was like 93, 94% voting approval. I would say it's representative of the whole of Venezuela, but given that they didn't get any sort of support from the government to organize the primaries, this was basically done with foreign funding and around 3.23 million people that were able to vote. Most people abroad, because again, in the inside of Venezuela, it was quite hard. And yeah, but... All the people that voted was vote for Maria Corina. So she was able to garner that public support to point to the 20th of July as the inflection point. Now, what, that's another important thing. It's the first time that there is complete 100% consensus, even between the people that do not like Maria Corina, that Venezuelans need to go to vote. Abstention has been a common policy pushed by political figures within the opposition. And Guaido comes out of one of those initiatives that people boycotted that presidential election in order to be able to make the argument that this weren't fair and fair elections and then use a constitutional mechanism so Guaido could take as head of the National Assembly come to the interim presidency. This time around, Everyone, it's, we have to vote, we have to vote, we have to vote. Everyone has to come to vote. If you can fly to Venezuela, you have to vote. So it's the first time that a concrete message that has also helped create the kind of momentum. So these primaries, you said they were organized outside of Venezuela? No, I exaggerated. The thing is, I don't remember the numbers. No, they were organized inside Venezuela. But the thing is, these were all volunteers. According to Venezuelan law, if you are going to run primaries, they have to be organized by the national, translation with the central national election. And, but... Obviously, they, they weren't going to support any type of primary activity election in Venezuela. This was all volunteer work. A lot of people, and this was basically only possible call, only possible because of the wide reach that a Maria Corina had across the country to organize people that would go to set up the tables and set up the voting mechanisms. This was all done by hand. But what was the purpose of the vote? Was it to choose the opposition candidate? Yes, to choose the opposition candidate. Most of them participated, except the people that were there just to sabotage, that have just, one of them, his last name is Prosperi, just declared support for Maduro. And he was supposed to be the head of one of the main opposition parties in government. So there were a few candidates that participated just to sabotage the whole mechanism. But again, Maria Corina won that vote. I think the second to last had a five, six percent of the vote. So over 90 points difference. It was very obvious that there was strong support for Maria Corina, even though that she's barred, as I mentioned. Okay, so you mentioned she's barred from being essentially in an election. So what was that then in play about the elections? Yeah, obviously that was a part of the conversation. Sure, she won the primary, but she cannot run for office. What's the whole point? So I think there was some sort of, I'm guessing, I'm not aware of any internal conversations, but I'm guessing Part of the plan, and as it has played out in retrospect, I think it was about, look, we cement Maria Corina as the leader of the opposition with the primaries, and then look for one of two things. One, to get her barring removed, or select someone that has her backing 
to run for office. Obviously, the first option was a long shot. Didn't happen. There was no way and they, they were going to let her run. And this was all in the context of the Barbados agreements. And this was a, a set of agreements signed between opposition candidates, the Maduro government, and some international governments, including the U.S., several governments from the EU, and other Latin American governments as well. So Brazil, Colombia, obviously Barbados. And it's pretty obvious that the Maduro government wasn't going to keep part of its commitments. One of them was running a fair and open election and letting opposition candidates run, including Maria Corina. That didn't happen. So what they did, this was a really political move. They named, so Maria Corina named a runner-up. Her name is Corina Lloris. They looked for someone named Corina, which is just a good coincidence. But if you look at a picture of her, and I don't say this in any bad connotation, she's your grandmother. Very well respected academic in Venezuela, years of service within academic circles, very uh, renounced, and again, also a woman. And because of cultural reasons, Venezuela is large in a Catholic country. Families, it's at the center of a lot of conversations. So this was also a strategic choice. They had no reason whatsoever to bar her substitute from running. They didn't allow her to inscribe her candidacy for the president. They simply didn't allow it. They just said, look, she hasn't been presented her credentials, invented, invented a bunch of things and didn't allow her. Around the same time, so there was a lot of political infighting, especially with another traditional Venezuelan opposition leader called Manuel Rosales. Let's just say, I won't get into details, but he's not that well liked by the large majority of Venezuelans because of a lot of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. He's one of the figures that a lot of people associate with failings from the opposition. But st he's still pretty popular in his home state of Zulia, which is the oil powerhouse of Venezuela, or used to be. And he was the preferred candidate for Maduro because in the past he has negotiated with government, he has looked to coexist with government. That has been his political approach. So they allowed him to go to the electoral office and register. He was the only one that was allowed. This was all done online. And when they were trying to register Corina Lloris, the website simply didn't load. And they tried, they showed videos. It was pretty obvious. Just hours before, and this is something very peculiar of the Venezuelan voting legislation, is that you can register a person to hold the position, not to run. We're going to register someone because you have to be a member of a political party. So the political party names its representative and that representative registers to run for presidency. One of the main political parties, the one that united most of the opposition, wasn't allowed to register someone because the website didn't load. But they were able to register a person to hold the position and that position can be held for 30 days. So who was named as the candidate that was supposed to be replaced eventually became the current nominee which is Edmundo Gonzalez. Where does Edmundo come from? He was a traditional diplomatic official. He was ambassador to Argentina in the mid to late 90s. And then he had another ambassadorial position. I can't remember where. Is under Chavez? No, the second one was under Chavez at the beginning of Chavez's presidency. But again, he is a career diplomat. And he had been outside of any public office for quite a more than 15 years now. But apparently, I had no idea who he was till he was named. He has been one of those backstage figures that is basically has served as an advisor to a lot of people within the camp of the opposition. Very well respected by everyone. And while in front of the cameras, it seemed like there was a lot of political bickering going on between a lot of people from the opposition, I think, I don't know if this was on purpose or not, but regardless of the reason, it caught the government completely blindsided. Because at the end, it turns out if after those period of time where the position holder, that period ended, after that period ended, it wasn't clear if they automatically became the candidate or not. Again, not even the government didn't understand quite well its own, the Venezuela's legislation. Long story short, that period ended and he became the de facto candidate for the opposition. Did Maria Corina support him? 
Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. I think this is complete speculation on my part, but I think that was, it couldn't have been a coincidence. I think that had to be talked beforehand. But once he was accepted by the registry, Maria Corina went all in backing Edmundo Gonzalez as the person that is going to bring us out of this mess. So it's incredible because Nowadays, that happened around a month ago, a month and a half. Maria Corina is a person touring the country because of a lot of reasons. He's 70, he's mid 70s. I don't know his, his exact age. He looks great. But the thing is going on the road in Venezuela with all the difficulties that I just explained and not even being able to get on a plane or anything, it's, it can be pretty gruesome. So Maria Corina is the one touring the country. Why can't he get on a plane? They just barred him from the government. Maria Corina, supposedly because she is promoting... It's a law that prohibits any kind of rhetoric perceived as anti-nationalist or anti-Venezuelan or promoting... Like a sanctions kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. They're sanctioned and they cannot get on any airline. And if an airline allows them on, they would probably suffer a huge penalty. So... Maricurina is going around all the country with Edmundo's flyer, <laughs> saying, "Lo, vote for this guy. And that was the reason why the, this other figure, Manuel Rosales, lost the power push for the candidacy. It was because Maricurina, there was no way in hell Maricurina was going to back this guy. At the end, he had to basically get on the boat, get on the same boat. And even Manuel Rosales's political party that has not so much following, but they do have important infrastructure that covers most of the country. So they also, because a lot of people close to him started to push him to support Marcos Edmundo Gonzalez and Maria Corina by, what would you say, just because Edmundo had Maria Corina's backing, that would mean a tacit support for Maria Corina as well. That was something, at least from the way he behaved publicly, that he didn't want to do. But there was a lot of pressure from people close to him to support a united candidacy around Edmundo and Maria Corina as the voice of the opposition, whoever became the candidate, wouldn't have been able to challenge Maduro in the way Edmundo has without Maria Corinas. This is something I just don't understand, is why does anyone think an election is a viable option. It, it doesn't seem like there's any rational thing to believe that Maduro will allow a fair election to happen. There isn't. Yeah. There isn't. So what is this entire thing even for? I think it's very deep down. Venezuelans, even after everything that's happened over the last two decades, it's a deeply democratic populace. And the fact that the abstention card has been played in several occasions with detrimental results has has also played a part here no one's naive and it expects the Maduro government to play fair in these elections they it's pretty obvious just yesterday they disappeared because we still don't know his whereabouts maria corina's head of security and just a couple of months ago it was her head of campaign and last week it was people from her team and so these are people who are recurrently detained and it's more about taking them out of play and destabilizing the current movement. It's not about that there's a lot of his that's still taking place. There's torture centers in Venezuela and then some horrible things still happening today. But in this specific context, I think there's just because there's international pressure, there's a lot of eyes on Venezuela, on Maduro trying to use these elections to finally get some legitimacy, get sanctions lifted from the, from part of the United States on part of the United States. So they have to to pretend as much impossible that this is, quote unquote, a fair playing field for the election. So it's more about disrupting, not about harming people as it was in the past. Sure, but then for the actual vote count. The bet is, and that's why the message has been very consistent that everyone has to vote, everyone. If you're abroad and you have, because that's the other thing, we cannot count with voting abroad because what were the numbers around only 
of the 8 million people that are abroad, obviously we cannot take the 8 million because a lot of them are underage. We don't know the numbers, but if we use general statistics, let's say a third are people from underage. So that would still leave very conservative numbers. Let's just, let's put it our own half. Let's say 4 million people, 4 million Venezuelans abroad can vote. So probably more, but let's just say 4 million. Of those 4 million, how many were able to, because you have to, if you want to vote abroad, you have to register at the local consulate. A lot of these countries still don't have goodness on consulates. What countries? Is this a multi-section market in the US? US, Central America, yeah, and that's it. And they don't have five the conflicts? I know because a lot of them close with the whole, you know, non-recognition of Maduro during the Guaido period. But most of them have reopened. The thing is, the ones that closed and reopened, it's been done in a very poor way. And then they don't have the infrastructure or the means to act, set up a proper consulate or embassy. But still, it's correct what you mentioned. It's a minority. Colombia has a consulate and it's the country where most Venezuela live, over two and a half million. And again, going back to the four million figure, only I think it was 7,000 people were able to register to vote abroad. I would assume also these people wouldn't have easy proof that they are Venezuelan. It depends on where you are. Probably no passport, you know, so on. IDs. The passport ID. thing was a huge problem. But the thing is, it, you shouldn't require that. You With your Venezuelan ID, you could go to a consulate. If you have an ID. Yeah. And uh, IDs in Venezuela weren't that much of a problem. Passports were a huge problem. IDs, not so much. And again, in theory, even with an expired ID, you could register. The thing is, they put a lot of roadblocks from you have to present just this one requirement. In order to register abroad, you have to present your credentials that you are a legal resident of the country. With that prerequisite, you basically barred who knows, 80, 90% of people. Because either because they are there illegally. I lived in Colombia for five years. I had a work visa. Even if I wanted to vote in Colombia, I couldn't because that was a working visa. It wasn't a residence permit. So in Colombia, to be considered a resident, you needed, of I think it's four years, with continuous visas, which didn't apply in my case, to be considered a resident. Right there, you just completely blew off everyone that lived in, in Colombia to vote. And it was the same everyone. And a lot of times when, even when you did have everything that they required, the, the huge lines outside of consulates, they were the, the pace that they were carrying out the registry was here in Madrid. I remember it was around only 60, 70 people were able to register in a month that they gave people. It was an obvious policy being implemented to bar people because they know that odds are that if you're abroad, you would vote against. Now, the election is less than two weeks. If it is the case that Maduro, quote unquote, wins the election, what then do you think? I believe that given what we've seen from government over the last couple of years, I think they finally realized that they cannot get involved in the economy. That was part of one of the main reasons why we ended up where we did. So nowadays, even though that Venezuela's GDP has contracted over 80, 90% of what it used to be back in when Chavez was still alive. Nowadays, there seems to be some oxygen coming in because the government's not getting involved. There is a de facto dollarization of the economy. Right now, all across Venezuela, the only currency you use is US dollars. So for all the rhetoric, the anti-US, the anti-imperialist rhetoric, this not Venezuela, the main currency is the US dollar. You can now open a bank account and it's really easy in US dollars. In Venezuela. Yeah. And it's extremely weird because the Bolivar, the local currency, is still being used, but only at the moment of payment. How everyone manages is that you have a Bolivar account and you have a dollar account. All your money, savings, whatever, it's in your US dollar account. So when you're going to pay, what you do is you transfer, when you're going to spend 10 bucks. You transfer those 10 bucks to Bolivares instantaneously with your app on your phone, make the payment. So you pay with Bolivares, but everyone holds US dollars, be it in cash or 
in the bank. And uh, nowadays you don't have the black market, which is when you had a controlled currency exchange. So right now the US, the, there's still a currency control, but it's on par with the fluctuating US dollar. There's no need to go to a black market to acquire foreign currency, even though the, it's ridiculous, if you go to a supermarket, it's still prohibited by law to put prices in dollars. So right now, most places have a little screen that gets you just control it digitally and there's no symbol for the currency. There's just a number and it changes on a daily basis. But right now it's pretty stable, stable for Venezuelan standards. So it's just, I think around 10% of monthly inflation, which is pretty good for Venezuelan standards. And again, it really doesn't matter because you have everything in dollars. But yeah, you go to Silverman, it, it's just a number and you find out exactly how much you're gonna pay in Bolivar is once you get to a counter and they tell, look, today's exchange rate is, according to the Venezuelan central government, his central bank, it's X. But again, it fluctuates like any other place. That gives a sense of, you can stay here. You can at least work salaries, given the contraction of the economy and the amount of people left and there's still the problem with basic services exist. But at least nowadays you can earn in foreign currency, you can save in, in US dollars. And especially for businesses, the, the few that remain, they can operate and they can actually invest. You started seeing so the credit cards in Venezuela disappeared 15 years ago. You started seeing, and this is one of those weird effects of crisis that Venezuela has one of the highest banking, how do you call it when people are all involved in the banking sector or have bank accounts? That has a name, right? Anyways, a large majority of Venezuelans have a bank account. Now, I'm talking about over 90%. This is in Colombia is 50 or less than 50. Nowadays, it's extremely easy to move money around. You can do it with a bunch of tech startups that make it easy for you to send money with a traditional SMS text. So I just need your number and I, you know, give me your number and I'll text you. You don't even need data coverage to use this, which is extremely useful in a country that its internet coverage is dismal. So there's new apps for this just started a few months ago. So the first time I've seen it of loans. They had completely very small loans. So you could get a loan for 200 and it's a Venezuelan startup that uh, lifted some capital abroad and they're doing great. And they have been able to offer microloans to a bunch of people. So things are starting to move. And I think the government's very well aware of this. And I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket, but I think they will allow that to prosper. Because one of the most important change of the last six months was the lift of sanctions on Venezuela's oil industry. Not all of them, but they allowed Chevron to operate in Venezuela, which was a huge economic relief for the Venezuelan government. So they want to lift all the sanctions. So that's why I'm saying they're trying to play their cards in a way that this is at least as perceived internationally as a legitimate election. Maybe they did allow this, maybe they detained a bunch of people, but at the end of the day, there was a vote and people went out to vote in droves and Maduro managed to quote unquote win. I think regardless of who wins in the US in November, there's also appetite to normalize relations with Venezuela and Venezuela will become some, this sort of autocratic government that we can live with and everyone, the, the EU, the US can live with, also the rest of the countries in Latin America and Maduro stayed in power and that's how things are. And let's just live with this. It would surprise if they do that and still leave Cuba where it is. Yeah, that's a, a different ballpark. But I think, uh, yeah, the, Venezuela has enough leverage. At the end of the day, it's still a petro state. And given everything that's happening in the war in Ukraine, uh, so it's a way to normalize or add a little bit of, of stability. And if you allow companies, all companies to oil companies and uh, to return to Venezuela, might end up pumping a few years from now, million and a half, close to 2 million barrels a day. Who knows? So as long as and they have toned down their anti-US rhetoric and uh, for a while now. So I think if Maduro stays in power, we'll see more stability than the years before. And it's in their interest. And I think they are aware of this. 
So, Parsifal, I have many more questions. We didn't, we didn't even get to talk about China. <laughs> I mean, we should do a part two of, of this topic. But thank you so much for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. As we mentioned, right now we're both in Madrid, so there'll be a lot more opportunity to talk. That's it for this episode. For updates about the podcast, please subscribe to our Substack blog found on cpsi.media. You can also read our newsletters and long-form content on Caribbean policy improvements. 